Hello and welcome to another Tech Distractions video. In this one we'll be taking a look at an integrated graphics solution that was created by Trident Microsystems and released on motherboards by Via Technologies during the late 90s and early 2000s. It's got an interesting backstory and history, including some legal shenanigans. We'll go through how it came to exist, who it was for, and check out how it performs in Windows 98 SE and MS-DOS. The motherboard I'm using today is the MSI named MS6378 version 2. It is based on the VIA KLE133 chipset for the AMD Socket A platform, and this one specifically targeted, but wasn't limited to, the AMD Duron CPU. These boards were initially released in 2001, and were designed to be cheap micro ATX solutions for budget buyers. You'll notice that there's no AGP slot, and this is one of the trade-offs with these budget boards. This limits the upgrade path to PCI-based 3D cards. Taking a look at expansion now, we've got two PC133 SD RAM slots, two IDE and one floppy, three PCI slots, one riser for a modem. We've also got one space where an ISA slot could be. Disappointing, but not unexpected. In standard rear I.O. we've got PS2 keyboard and mouse, two USB 1.1 ports, parallel, serial, VGA, game port, and three audio jacks. The KLE133 was the AMD version of the earlier release ProMedia chipset that was used for Intel Socket 370 and Slot 1. The chipset featured a Trident-based 2D 3D AGP integrated into the North Bridge, 200MHz frontside bus, up to 133MHz of memory, integrated AC97 sound for Windows, a Legacy Sound Blaster Pro integrated audio into the 686B South Bridge, hardware monitoring, and ISA support. Not on this motherboard, unfortunately. It's interesting that in the product brief, VIA makes a comparison to Intel's 810, which was its first IGP chipset and it was released around a similar time, maybe a year or so beforehand. Now on to the focus of this project, the Integrated Graphics Processor, or IGP. This one is simply referred to as the KLE133-VT8361 Integrated Graphics, but there's a little bit more of a story behind it. VIA announced its first IGP solution on the MVP4 chipset for Socket 7 in August of 1998. They were happy to beat Intel to integrate the 2D 3D graphics into the Northbridge, but this wasn't designed or even created by VIA. According to VIA's datasheet, the IGP was actually based on Trident's Cyber 9398 DVD, which I find a little bit confusing as just about everybody else on the internet refers to this as the Blade 3D. Shortly after the MVP4 chipset was released, Trident would announce the Blade 3D as a discrete solution in November of 1998, with it being on sale shortly after in 1999. Anuntech would review an early card and pitch it as a competitor to the i740. And this was a bad thing. The i740 was already tanking in price around that time, and Blade 3D was going to be too little, too late. Plus, by then, Intel's drivers had improved a lot. It was a very solid but limited card. 1999 would prove to be an interesting year for VIA and Trident's relationship. In July, Trident found out about VIA's plans for its own graphics solution and filed a legal dispute for breach of contract and fraud. It attempted to stop the sale of VIA's MVP4 and ProMedia chipsets, but failed. Trident claimed VIA broke a manufacturing pact illegally lured 25 engineers to its own company and claimed to have knowledge of VIA's plans for mobile chipsets using competing S3 products, notably the tech that probably ended up being in the Super Savage MX. Although Trident's claim was for 200 million USD, it ended up being settled in April 2000 for around 10 million USD. VIA was able to continue using the Trident-based IGB and driver for its products that were on sale and under support. At the same time, VIA was settling the purchase of S3's graphics division. VIA were no stranger to legal wins and losses during this time. They were in almost a constant battle with Intel, OptiInc, and a bunch of other IP owners. As a bit of a middle finger, Trident started up an additional licensing agreement with a VIA rival, Acer Labs Inc., or ALI, and licensed their Blade 3D IGP to them. This is in both desktop and laptop markets, but unfortunately for Trident, that too was a short-lived arrangement. During 2000, VIA would release the ProMedia chipset which it had been in the legal battle for, and it was still based on the Trident IGP. The ProMedia chipset had a few name changes, including VIA Apollo PM601, then PLE133, and PLE133T. This was a Socket 370 chipset and could suit Intel or VIA's new CPUs. In September 28, 2000, VIA announced its plans for a low-cost information PC. This was super important for VIA who was trying to get into the mass market. I cover this topic in detail in my mini ITX history video. If you'd like to check this out, then feel free to queue it up. VIA intended to integrate its Cyrix 3 CPU and the ProMedia chipset and make entry-level PCs and devices for as little as $199 USD. In June 2001, at Computex, VIA announced the KLE133 chipset as a low-cost option for Duron processors 
using the AMD Socket A platform. Via would later drop the Trident IGP and stick with the S3 Pro Savage IGP instead. For the KLE-133, this time Via refers to the IGP as being based on the Blade 3D with a 64-bit core and memory bus with 2x AGP. The odds are it wasn't too much different to the one from the MVP4 era. Core speed could be anywhere from 90 to 110 MHz and memory could be up to 133 MHz. It supported OpenGL 1.1 and DirectX 3D version 6. It could share up to 8 MB of system memory and had MPEG-2 hardware acceleration for video playback. Unfortunately, we only get that single pipeline and text unit and software TNL. So here it is in my trusty ATX frame, ready for some bench testing. For memory, there's a single 256 MB stick of PC133 RAM, and we're going to sacrifice the maximum 8 MB for this IGP. I'm using the onboard sound as I'd like to see how it performs under MS-DOS. And finally for storage, I'm using my 16GB SD card because it's only for temporary use. These guys aren't great for long-term storage usage, but I do find them convenient for quick projects like this one. First we start with some MS-DOS benchmarks and games. DOSBench is a good baseline test. The Juro 950 is a powerful CPU and will have no trouble with DOS games. In fact, you'll need to slow it down for some older titles. Enabling right combining move the dial on some of the results. For overclocking, the Juron cannot have its multiplier changed. Unless you do the pencil mod, that is. Instead, I enabled a 10% frontside bus overclock using the BIOS. Generally speaking, I wouldn't do this if I intended to use PCI expansion cards, as it can cause some stability issues. However, in this case, I figured it was worth taking a look. I didn't get a single crash throughout my testing. Pushing it any higher, I started to notice some issues with particularly the hard disk access. So checking the results with overclocking and write combine enabled, we see we get a small boost to scores, but it really doesn't matter. I'm more interested to see how this overclock goes under Windows a bit later. Real world gaming is a bit more interesting because we've got a legacy sound block in the south bridge of this chipset. This means that you can use the onboard sound in real mode DOS. Luckily this BIOS allows you to configure and reserve the resources. But even if your BIOS doesn't have these settings, you can still use an excellent utility written by Jay's Fox called Via SBCFG. I've put a link down in the comments below. To enable FM, all you need to do is run the Via FM TSR utility. It is a TSR that unfortunately does take a hefty 32 kilobytes of conventional memory, unless you can load it high. But as I'm not using any memory management except for HiMem.sys, I don't get that option.
Results are mixed. Doom and Duke 3D all seem to sound alright to me. But there was a few letdowns. Stunts' FM is absolutely awful. And Keen sounded very strange. One thing to note here is the audio solution to 686B was found on a few thin client machines, most of which don't have any PCI expansion. If I was stuck with this solution, I'd look to set up a boot menu with SBMU and use this for games that don't play nice with via FMTSR. SBMU is an amazing project that utilizes software emulation of the Legacy Sound Blaster and FM Synth Thunder DOS. I've put a link to this in the description below in case you've not heard of it before. For this project we're using Windows 98 SE and I can test some of the earlier 3D games and retain some DOS support. The driver I'm using is 3124 for DirectX and 3117 for OpenGL. And unfortunately there are zero options to disable VSync and even PowerStrip doesn't help us. There's very little to the drivers actually, other than some basic colour settings which is disappointing, but I guess it's expected from Trident. At certain resolutions the IGP can output 85Hz, so hopefully that helps a little. My scaler will just accept it and spit out 60Hz to the capture device anyway. CPU-Z finds our Duron processor, and benchmark results get us 1792.5 for the CPU and 6964.6 .6 for the FPU. Compared to the via Eden CPUs I've been working with lately, you can see that AMD has got a much stronger FPU here. Hardware info detects the IGP at 4 times speed and lists the Cyberblade i7 which is slightly different to what we saw in MS-DOS with SpeedSys, where it detected the Cyberblade i1. My take is the Cyberblade i1 is probably closer to the pin as the KLE133 is very similar to the PLE133. But I reckon it doesn't really matter, it's just a Blade 3 IGP anyway. Let's see how it goes under Windows 3D Gaming. Starting out with Expendable, I used the lowest settings possible. At 384p we got 28.3 frames per second, with a drop to 25.5 when 480p was used. For an older game I find Expendable to be a bit of a brutal test for these older IGPs. I wouldn't find these frame rates too fun especially when we get to the busier scenes of the game. GeoQuake performs pretty well at 384p, and back in the day I would have been happy enough with this. I used to rely on this resolution for first person shooters, it actually scales pretty well on CRTs and gave me much needed frames at the time. And that's pretty lucky for Trident, because higher resolutions aren't very friendly with it. Incoming runs ok at 384p and holds on at 480p but only just. Forsaken is kind to IGPs, but unfortunately VSync ruins it. At 384p the Trident will only output 60Hz no matter what I tried, so we hit the ceiling straight away and remain pegged at that till the end. 480p can output 85Hz, and while this still hits the ceiling it doesn't really impact the gameplay as much. I'd probably use the 480p setting in this one. Stepping up to Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed we can actually see 480p lower settings of the Trident. It's cinematic at best, 24.5 frames. It's playable, but not very enjoyable. Quake 2 performs ok, getting a smidge over 40 frames per second at 384p. It'd get the job done in single player, but when there's a lot of explosions and action going on you'd probably see some dips. Quake 3 on 384p faster setting that's us about 35.4 frames per second. And while this looks ok as a score, unfortunately this is the best case scenario. There's quite a few dips here and there even in the time demo, it's not a very good experience. Two Rocket 384p lowest hangs on well at 47.7 frames per second. A little bit like Quake 2, if you played it in single player mode, it'd get the job done. And finally with synthetics, 3D Mark 99 at 600p gets us 1915 3D Marks and 12015 for the CPU. 2001 SE at 480p gets us 617 3D Marks, a pretty lowly result. I was curious to see how this compared to previous IGP projects. Looking at my notes from earlier videos on the Intel 810 chipset and the SIS 300 chipset, both of which use PC133 memory and Intel Pentium 3s, it looked like it might be an interesting comparison to pitch it against the Trident. You can consider this a compilation of earlier results for indication purposes. I did test with the same methods, but take the results with the appropriate grains of salt of course. Quake 3 using the fastest setting at 384p we see Intel pull away and almost crack 60 frames a second. SIS still gave an ok result, but the Trident was left lagging behind. As I mentioned earlier, I felt the Trident was not smooth at all in Quake 3. Need for Speed unfortunately wouldn't run on the SIS when overclocking was used. At stock values it was only a frame or two ahead of the Trident. Intel wins here again and we almost crack 60 as an average, but not quite. With Forsaken, I didn't run this on the Intel unfortunately. I reckon it would have gone quite nicely. At 480p it's neck and neck between the SIS and Trident. At 600p the SIS pulls away. At 768p all of these aren't fun frame rates anyway, but the Trident does get a little W here. 
Incoming at 480p was the only resolution I tried on all three IGPs, and SIS gets the win here, but again it's only against the stock Intel result. The Trident struggles to keep up. With GL Quake again, Trident is left behind with some big gaps appearing. With Expendable, we get roughly the same low scores. The SIS was the only IGP that had the both GPU and CPU overclocked, and reviewing that previous video, which I've linked below if you want to check it out, I do think the overclock gave it a reasonable boost. In the Trident's case, even with a CPU overclock, we just don't get the fill rate required to keep up with anything above 384p. The Intel and SIS did better jobs across the board. IGPs really started to ramp up as 2001 and 2002 rolled on. VIA went on with the S3-based solutions and its Unichrome IGP. Unfortunately for Trident, it would fade off into the sunset before merging parts of its business with SIS and forming XGI, the makers of the Volari range of graphics cards. NVIDIA wasn't far away from releasing its first Enforce chipset and was already partnering with ALI to integrate the Reva TNT series into some of its chipsets. ATI had their first Radeon-based solution coming shortly after in 2002, Intel had released its extreme graphics overhaul of the i752, and it was also a time that low-end discrete cards started to increase in performance and lower in cost. There are a lot of options for gamers of all budgets. So that's about it for this one. If you're still here, thank you very much for hanging around. I really appreciate looking at the analytics and seeing viewers sticking it out until the end of these videos. I hope you enjoyed a look at a 3D IGP from a bygone era, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.